You are tuned to Kenneth Zenith Cablevision. Thank you for watching. It's time for talk. Each evening at this time, Monday through Friday, Rosemary interviews local personalities and others who bring items of interest to this community. Time for Talk is a community betterment service. Tonight, Rosemary takes us by means of portable camera out of our studios and maybe into your neighborhood. And now, it's time for Talk. The immediate answer, of course, was the railroad, which penetrated this jungle of mud and water. A great project was proposed to encourage the railroads to build a line down the high ridge between the huge East Swamp and the St. Francis River Swamp. First railroad and the most successful railroad early across the state was the Hannibal St. Joe. Second was the Missouri Pacific. But then there was a railroad that took off from St. Louis and came down called the St. Louis and Iron Mountain Railroad, and it came all the way down to Pilot Knob and Potosi, where they were mining iron ore. When, when the railroad comes in, towns boom. Kansas City had taken off and surpassed St. Louis, and wherever the railroad went, went success and prosperity. But railroads cost money to build. And yet, everyone was convinced that's what we needed. The federal government was convinced that's what we, were, what we needed. And so railroads were able to gain a tremendous advantage. They were able to get money from three different sources, from federal land grants, from state bonds, from county bonds, and from private individuals. There was a rail line that was proposed to be built from Cairo to Fulton, Arkansas on the Texas line. It was to come down through Charleston, it was to come on down to Poplar Bluff, and then on down into uh, Arkansas. Duncan Countyans got very excited about this rail line that was to come across because this supposedly was to come within one mile of the Duncan County border, and this would enable us to get agricultural crops north. However, there is a lot of difference in what's on a map proposed and what is really done. What happened was the federal government had, gave, had given all sorts of lands for right-of-way. In fact, uh, every other even-numbered section of land, six miles on either side of the railroad was given. The federal government had deeded the swamp land back to the counties. The county court could dispose of that as any way it saw fit, and to give that swamp land to the railroad to help it come through. Actually, it wasn't even coming through. It was only coming north of Duncan County. But the amount of land that changed hands over this is an incredible thing. I have the figure right behind here. Now, remember, the federal government had, uh, had given right-of-way lands. Now, this is the county part, and this is the way to this new CNF proposed railroad to get, in, to get it near us. Stoddard County gave 150,000 acres at a dollar an acre, and this was the subscription. Butler County gave 100,000 acres. Duncan County gave 100,000 acres. Scott gave 50, and Ripley gave 19,500. Now, the railroads, in turn, could issue land certificates. And in this case, you have a, a copy of a land certificate for $100 issued by the Cairo and Fulton Railroad State of Missouri. And this was enabled them to just get close enough uh, to Duncan County to help it. The county says, we didn't get our railroad that even came close, so you don't own the land. Shadow says, I do own the land. I've been paying taxes on it, and I've already sold some of that land. The county had already sold some of the land because the railroad hadn't come through. What a mess we had. However, the railroads came, and they were spurred by the timber industry, which required a means to get logs to the mills back in the east. Numerous small railroads sprang into existence. Dummy lines reached from the main line to serve the timber camps. And we had all this virgin timber out here. And they would cut it, and they'd put it on these dummy lines. 
You want a dummy line? Uh, a dummy line just connects a, a, a big line. Dummy. Where did it make that connection? I mean, how far did they have to go? Crothersville? Hey, Ty. Hey, Ty. Uh -huh. hey, Ty. And then it was also one at Crothersville, but Hey, Ty was the big one. All right. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you, there were dummy lines in from that, but now there were a lot of other lumber. I remember closer to Kennett, there was a hemp hill. Uh, uh, there were lots of lumber companies. Okay. Yeah. All right. Remember, I'm sure you've heard of Lewis Houck. Yes, I have. Oh, okay. he's the one that's responsible for all these railroads that we have down here. Because he told them that he would come down and build a railroad, and all he wanted was just every other farm. Did he get it? Well, they tell me in the town of Haytai, where he told them he wanted every other lot, he got it. Many proposed railroad lines died on the drawing board never receiving approval or enough support to be built. Uh, there was the, uh, uh, here's a profile of the Texas and St. Louis Railroad, uh, the St. Louis, Arkansas, and Texas Terminal through Duncan County, St. Louis and Gulf Railroad uh, profile, 19-2, which are, this is uh, 1888, the uh, St. Louis, Arkansas, and Texas Terminal. It was the smaller line that really benefited the boot heel. P and S E cardboard to Hornersville, and uh, that was that was a rea reality. You see the date July 1897, uh, right here at the bottom when when this one was submitted. July 1897, that road was a reality in the Hornersville area. You see the words heavy timber, heavy timber here. The railroad went right out into the heavy timber, and I suppose they floated the logs up to where they needed to get them to get on here. This is all Little River drainage, Little River, that flooded into the Hornersville area. And uh, this was a long map, uh, very well done. Starts off over here, let me get it all the way back to the front. Starts off. actually in the Cardwell area. And what I would like for you to see about Cardwell, of course, Bertig owned all the lands in Cardwell, and it was all swampy and timbered. You see the words box factory. Cardwell had one of the largest in the early teens and 20s. Cardwell had one of the largest box factories in the world. So you had sloughs, timber, and a rail line that came through went right out into the middle of Little River and uh, picked up the logs, and they were shipped out toward Perigo. This is a profile map of the Dunklin County and Memphis Railroad. Now, some of uh, this some history, I'm sure, that's accurate on this. This was uh, submitted in April 24, 1889. This is a profile map of the Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana Railroad. This came in April 20th, 1883. These trains proved extremely beneficial for passenger travel. One must remember uh, that the Swamp East, as this area was indelicately called by Upper Missourians, was virtually an island surrounded by an almost impenetrable jungle of water and forest. The Kennet and Southeast, referred to lovingly as the KSE, connecting Nimmons, Arkansas, Kennet, Haytai, Carothersville, and also Blytheville, was especially appreciated as a way to the outside world. Well, you know, we had a connection that we even had a, a Pullman that. Uh, uh, made up here, a Pullman train, a Pullman car, and faster train, and would go over to Haytai and stay until, I think it was about 12, and then it was attached to a train from Memphis and taken in St. Louis, and you get in, you get on here at 6 o'clock, and you ride off at St. Louis at at seven in the morning. Oh, so and you could come back the same way. Okay. If we had, if we had that uh, service. Passenger was not the uh, primary function of it. It was freight as well. Okay. Because what were the shape of the roads in that in that? Well, yeah, there there just weren't any highways. I remember when oh, I was eight or ten years old when we'd go up to Camel to visit my grandparents. 
uh, it would take us all day to drive up there. We'd pack our lunch, and we'd pull in the churchyard about half them and eat a lunch, and then go on the rest of the way. So Campbell was an all-day trip? Yeah, just about, yeah. Okay, all right. And as far as uh, from here to Haytire, you couldn't do it. Uh, we even had a sleeper. We could go to St. Louis if they had the money. And uh, you know, you get on the train down here at this railroad station, this little station we have down there now, or I guess it's been torn down, and uh, go to sleep if you liked, and then the train would hook on later at night, take you over to that and take you to St. Louis and bring you back. And when you got off in the mornings, why well, you, you uh, be right here at home. I worked here in Kennett my first year in high school uh, here in Kennett and for the St. Louis, Kennett, and Southeastern Railroad, which you probably don't remember. No, no. But it's right where Bill Jones has his oil company now, and uh, Jack Henderson has a filling station. That was a depot. And I was uh, roused about there for the railroad and got to working for W.D. Lassville, a real old-timer in Kennett. And he was president of the railroad. Russell Pankey was vice president. And I worked for them. I was, my title was assistant to the president. Boy. But I didn't do anything. I'd get a pass, and they'd have assistant to the president on it. I'd get a pass to ride to St. Louis for nothing. On these lines also came the drummers, or the salesmen, by the hundreds. The old Decker Hotel, now in 1994 the home of Charlie's Pizza, was a very busy place. Here the salesmen rented rooms, ate home-style cooking, and left their names engraved upon history. The depot was handily nearby. The area became a paradise for hunting and fishing. The railroads cooperated fully. Hunting lodges sprang up in many places. These views from an advertising brochure of the Buffalo Island route show all the comfortable offerings of these lodges. They provided much pleasure for people from out of state and from the north, as well as for the local population. I work as a fisherman and a hunter's paradise. Do you remember any, do you remember seeing lots of game or lots of people oh, come down? Get out of here. They shipped it. Did they buy it? Did they take the hides and the they took the hides, bought hides, sent his grandfather, bought hides at his store, and the other merchants here did. And uh, oh, they trapped and they, they had a boat dock or a fish dock called it. And the fishermen would bring their fish in, their ducks, turtles, and all kinds of game that they caught and hunted them. Businessmen from St. Louis come here and go down on the lake. And the Buckhart, Jim Buckhart, kept them, you know. Was it sort of a lodge or a uh, hunter's? Uh, he had boat houses, a uh, big enough place to have several at a time. They used to live on the water all the time in a boat house. And then they bought some land. Now emerged the boom town. Flourishing with the timber industry, they grew from lumber camps into prospering towns, which served not only the timber interests, but also the growing number of farmers who were working hard to clear the land. You, you worked for Hemphill Lumber Company. Yes. Now, uh, how far out of town was that? Oh, Lord, I worked over the reefs for them. Well, what did you do? Talking about when you went out in the country. Oh, I kept orders. You kept orders out yeah. there? Uh, one time I had 120 men eating. Oh, well, now, uh, we're talking about way down in the yeah, area, down around the reefs. Way down there the, on the railroad. Dummy line, we called it. Okay, now, why? what does dummy line mean? It was a train. But the train went out and picked up logs. Okay. It was well, we out here on the main Frisco. Yeah. And they had a branch line that run back down in here. Okay. In the woods. On the other side of flood breaks. Okay. And that's where I took. All right. Uh, and then it was quite a distance out of town. Oh, yeah. 
and so they would stay down there yeah. uh, a week at a time, all right? And you had how many? A hundred and what? Hundred and twenty. Hundred and twenty. Had now, where, did, where did they live? They slept with sleep shacks. Is that wrong or any road? In what sleep shacks, did you say? <laughs> In little old buildings, little ca cars. They were cars, that's what they were. Cars? Yeah, and they made sleep You mean the railroad cars? Well, did they slept in the railroad cars. They, 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 they set them cars. They set them cars along that right down the line. Railroad. Okay. And the men had beds in them. Sure. They slept sure. Them. Good idea. Okay. And and uh, and then you would feed them. Yeah, I cook for them. I had the boarding shack over that side. Okay, a boarding shack. All right, a sleep <laughs> shack and a boarding shack. Now I like these terms. That's where they eat. All right. Now, I had two great long tables as long as this house, and they was full three times a day. And at midnight, <coughs> when the big train come out from Kitty and got the logs and brought them into the sawmill, well, I got up and fixed their boys' supper at midnight. A lot, a lot of nights. And then, okay, now tell me how you'd get that much groceries out from town here. I come here at Dima Hurd's store. He had a store over here, but just across from the car. Uh, Hotel, then. Okay, from the Cotton Bowl Hotel. Yeah. And what was his name? Dima Hurd. Okay, that's the name of the store? Hurd's. And I'd order my groceries by flat car loads.